So looking at our elective LVAD program, we've got five transplant surgeons, but only one of them has uh, an interest in the implantable LVADs. So it means that we have a very good working relationship with um, the one surgeon. So far since um, 2012, we've done 82 um, LVADs, starting off initially with the HeartMate 2s and HeartWares and moving to the HeartMate 3s uh, in 2015. So the vast majority of these patients are in hospital for a couple of weeks before their operation, which gives the anaesthetic team um, some time to um, have a look at the preoperative organ optimization. And often for the, first, for the 48 hours prior to surgery, the patients are coming to our ICU and we're floating uh, PA catheters and paying very close attention to optimizing preoperative anemia, ensuring the antiplatelet drugs are stopped and looking at particularly at the renal and uh, hepatic function, which we know will contribute to any postoperative problems. Often the patients are massively fluid overloaded when they come into hospital and started on a fruzamide infusion. The, the combination of drugs that we use in Manchester tends to be dopamine, milrinone, and fruzamide infusion. So in terms of where these patients fit in the Intermax classification, um, the patients coming for the, the permanent LVADs are, are the frequent flyer, the inotrope dependent patients. So Intermax for in and out of hospital having their diuretics optimized to becoming stable on the dopamine or known infusion. So I know you've had some talks already today about predicting RV failure, but why is this important, particularly when we're talking about bleeding, hemostasis? We know that these patients with RV dysfunction will likely develop liver dysfunction. They may already have some liver dysfunction, liver congestion or liver ischemia from um, problems with their blood pressure and perfusion preoperatively. Echocardiography can also be used, and I'm sure you've heard about the right ventricular stroke work index and pulmonary artery pulsatility index. The other groups of patients that we're becoming more and more involved in is the Intermax 1 population. So patients presenting in cardiogenic shock, and we've audited these. Uh, we had 33 patients from 2005 to 2014. But in the last couple of years, we're getting around about 40 patients a year presenting Intermax 1. So these tend to be young patients, a mean age of 39.5, presenting with dilated cardiomyopathy, ischemic cardiomyopathy, viral myocarditis, and a couple of postpartum cardiomyopathy patients. And if we look at bleeding in these patients, 32% of patients were taken back to theatre for bleeding. This is excluding post-cardiotomy via ECMO and excluding transplant via ECMO. So patients presenting in cardiogenic shock. And these patients often arrive at our hospital intubated on 90% oxygen, deranged liver function, deranged uh, renal function, acidotic, and taken straight to theatre. So these patients are very high risk of bleeding. And as you can see, 32% go back to theatre for bleeding. If we look through the literature, we can see um, patients re requiring surgery for, ble for bleeding, 26% from this paper. Um, from Jack in 2008. Looking at predicting bleeding uh, in LVAD patients, the MELD score, which some of you may be familiar with, people that work in liver transplant, the model for end-stage liver disease has now been used to predict LVAD um, transfusion requirements, morbidity, mortality. And certainly we've been caught out in a number of patients presenting for heart transplant, where initially the scans have suggested liver congestion or liver ischemia, but actually when the hepatologists have done biopsy, they've got established liver cirrhosis. So it's probably worth thinking about getting hepatology opinions and maybe getting a biopsy. Because if these patients have got established liver cirrhosis and they run into problems with right ventricular failure afterwards, we found that we've been unable to wean them off the uh, ventricular supports. So we're talking about hemostasis on the ICU, but really the decision making needs to happen way before they arrive on the ICU. And we need to be thinking about what technique we want to do in these patients. Do we want to do peripheral ECMO versus central ECMO initially, and then think about converting to a bivad LVAD, or do we want to go straight for this um, from the onset? So this is the sort of patient that we're talking about, an Intermax 1 patient that's come in the, the acute situation from the, from the uh, cath lab, They've had a PCI to the LAD. They're obviously loaded with the antiplatelet agents, so aspirin, tacacrylor. They're now in worsening cardiogenic shock. The ALT and bilirubin are high. They're not passing urine. Their INR is 2.5. And they're now having reperfusion arrhythmias. So this is a patient that we had last week. And you can see from the platelet mapping, they've clearly got um, depression of the ADP receptor and the aspirin receptor. Their INR, as we said, is deranged. They're acidotic. Do we want to be taking this patient to theatre and opening the chest? Because we know that's highly going to be likely to lead to bleeding problems and potentially reopening. So what technique 
would we consider doing in this patient? So we found that our surgeons prefer to do central ecmotor fire, the axillary artery and the groin, and then we can stabilize the patient over 48 hours, and then if we need to convert to a bivad at a later stage, that will reduce the problems that we have with bleeding. We've looked at platelet mapping. TEG, we always would do a baseline TEG. Um, particularly in the theatre environment, talking about human factors, in our hospital, the blood transfusion centre is at the other side of the city. So we need to make sure that when we come off bypass, we've got all the products ordered. Otherwise, it's quite embarrassing when you say to the surgeon, the platelets won't be here for another two hours. Um, we also use DDAVP, tranexamic acid, and Traslol, I'm sure you've heard um, from other talks. Just put this, um, this video in um, for some of the, the service that we've set up in Manchester looking at ECMO CPR. Um, and obviously these patients in the cath lab who we've said they'll be fully loaded with aspirin and ticaculor. And whenever we're called to an emergency in the cath lab, I always assume that the platelet function is going to be wiped out and we need to order platelets. I'm not quite sure whether we can play this video. So, oh, here we are. So this is the service that we're now offering in Manchester for patients coming in through the emergency department or in the cath lab, um, where we put them on peripheral VA. And this is the simulation uh, going on. In the operating theatre, I think it's, it's fair to say that the anaesthetist needs to be fairly firm with the surgeon and we need to be making the decision with them when they close the chest, if at all we do close the chest, whether we pack the chest um, with packs or whether we apply a membrane. But certainly we need to send the surgeon for a hemostatic break because we certainly don't want to be closing with this mess, otherwise we're going to be called back later. When we're talking about transfusing blood products, we've heard earlier on today about FFP and obviously comparing FFP to Oxaplex and the volume that you have to give the patient. And we're always thinking, particularly in the VAD patients, about the right ventricle and right ventricular dilatation. We're also thinking about Trali because we've had a couple of patients, particularly heart transplant patients, that have had reactions to platelets. And certainly they, they then fall in a heap from a respiratory point of view. And you're difficult, having difficulty ventilating, you'll have serious issues with PVR and right heart failure. And also in patients who are putting emergency VADs in who are potentially going to go on to have transplant, we need to think about sensitization. There's one patient that always remind, we remind ourselves of a, a young girl who came in with a dilated cardiomyopathy that had um, then developed a peripartum cardiomyopathy, had a massive um, obstetric hemorrhage and ended up having 35 units of blood. And she came to our unit and was unable to have a transplant because of all the antibodies that she developed. So on the critical care unit, what things are going through our mind when we're reviewing patients? So this is a patient that's come out of theatre with the LVAD. You can see that they're paced. There is some, the aortic valve is opening occasionally. We've got the PA pressure, CVP. The patient is obviously ventilated. This is our ECMO coordinator squeezing some of the cell safe blood in, looking at the ECMO flows. So these patients are different to the routine cabbage patient that may be bleeding with a low CVP. What things are we thinking about that's different with the VAD patients? And obviously we're thinking about the, the LVAD and the flows, and possibly the pulsatility index. We're also thinking about what's actually happening within the right ventricle. Because we know that when the LVAD goes in, we, will, we should expect to see reductions in the PA pressures, and of course the right ventricular afterload will go down. But if we start flooding the patient with lots of fluid, then increased venous return to the right heart may worsen the right heart function. The intraventricular septum has, uh, has, of course, changed, and that may worsen RV contractility if we overload the patient. So we need to be careful when we're thinking about pouring blood products in if the patient's bleeding and try and think of um, a strategy that's different to our routine cardiac patients. I don't know if you can see this clearly, but this is a patient from the other week that had a HeartMate 3 and a temporary RVAD. And you can see here, this, uh, this is the... Um, the ICU recording over the night time period. So they had one, two, three, four, five bags of blood, some, a bag of platelets, some cryo, cell safe blood returned. And if we look here, this is the cell safe blood drainage. So you can see overnight the patient, the first hour was 360 mils drained, 160, 60, 35. All the blood products were in. Think, things seemed to tail off. And then again in the morning, 160 mils an hour, 260 mils an hour, 120 mils an hour. So the patient's had lots of blood products, but still seems to be trickling. This, this patient's chest wasn't closed because of the RV dysfunction and a membrane was applied. So when the surgeon comes in the morning, 
we want to show them that we've at least tried to uh, correct all the coagulopathy because they're going to ask what does the tag look like and it's quite embarrassing if uh, there's an obvious protamine deficiency or something that we could have corrected so here's the tag in the morning we've given all the blood products the tag looks fairly normal the ma is 53 the r times 5.6 there's no difference in the um, heparinase and plain cup the patient's warm, they're not acidotic. So we've done as much as we can do on the ICU and now it's probably time to have a look and re-explore the chest. So we re-explored the chest on the unit. There was quite a lot of clots from around the front of the chest. And I think one of the problems when you don't close the chest, the if you've got bleeding around the bone marrow, that would that would normally stop if that's wired. But obviously the chest is open with the membranes. So there's lots of blood clots around the marrow. And when these were taken out, the flows did improve slightly and nearly a litre of blood came out from the right pleura. So worthwhile exploring the patient um, after we've corrected the coagulopathy. Looking at the other problems that we have, particularly with ECMO patients um, on the ICU, this is bleeding around the cannula site, which is fairly common in, in the VV ECMO population. We've had quite a lot of problems with airway bleeding, particularly um, patients with anchor positive vasculitis that we've had on respiratory ECMO, where we've actually had to clamp the ET tube for at least a week until we've got on top of the um, inflammatory process. Tracheostomies, in our respiratory ECMO population, we've stopped trache doing tracheostomies now until they're off ECMO just because of the bleeding problems we've had. Obviously, in patients with VADs who are being worked up for a transplant, they need to be weaned off a ventilator and need to be awake neurologically before they can have the transplant assessment. So we are cautious with tracheostomies, but in those populations, we have to do it. Um, I just put this in pictures of bougies. We've had a couple of problems with the newer types of bougie are quite rigid at the end. Um, so now on the ICU, we're using the soft-tipped catheters for re-intubating patients. NG tubes and TOEs. We've had quite a lot of problems with oropharyngeal bleeding requiring ENT inputs, particularly packing in these patients who are obviously either auto-anticoagulated or on heparin infusion. And um, we're always warning our trainees about doing TOEs unnecessarily in the middle of the night because we have had lots of bleeding problems. So always worth thinking about bleeding around the airway. There's a saying that if you're dry, you will fly. Um, we've heard you know, through various lectures that bleeding on the ICU leads to prolonged ICU stay, renal support. And obviously, if we've got patients who are on the ICU for a couple of weeks after the operation, that does have some cost and impact on our departmental activity. It's worthwhile saying that, particularly in the BIVAD patients, if you do get collections, you may need to open the chest in a hurry. And we've had a couple where they've arrested on the unit, and we make sure that all our staff are trained with simulation according to the CALS life support. So this is um, one of our anaesthetic registrars and one of the nurses opening the chest. Um, and the recommendations from the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery in 2009, that internal cardiac massage is superior to external massage. So we would aim to open the chest quickly on the ICU. We're talking about managing bleeding, but we're all fairly um, paranoid about thrombosis, particularly in these devices. So the question is, when do we start heparin? Well, I suppose that I guess that is affected by the surgical plan, but certainly for the first 24, 48 hours in these patients, we don't run heparin. Um, the vast majority of patients are often auto-anticoagulated, particularly the Intermax 1 patients that are presenting with liver dysfunction. It's worthwhile thinking about certain groups of patients. So patients on VA ECMO who may not be ejecting any blood to the lungs, there's a real worry that those patients will get clots in the lungs. And if they get clots in the lungs, they may not then be suitable for transplant. So it's always worth knowing whether the patient's got some underlying ejection when the balloon pump's in standby. If they're in sinus rhythm, then that obviously, and they're ejecting, that's better. But we've had some patients who've been in VF for at least 48 hours and we can't get them out of VF. And the stasis then causes clots um, in the atrium and in, into the pulmonary veins. And obviously those patients then are not suitable for transplant either. Um, I thought I'd mention heparin resistance because we have had a couple of patients, particularly the BIVAD patients who the longest BIVAD we've had is 140 days waiting for a transplant. And these patients, obviously, if they're in hospital for a couple of months on heparin, may develop this acquired antithrombin 3 deficiency. If you survey most of the centres around the world, very few people, I think, are doing routine antithrombin-3 uh, measurements, but you can measure the uh, antifactor 10A level. And we now have in our theatre fridge uh, antithrombin-3 concentrate, particularly if you're taking these patients to theatre for a, a transplant and need to go on bypass. If you haven't got the antithrombin-3 available, you need to give large volumes of FFP, which you don't really want to do in a transplant setting. <laughs> 
Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is something that we're seeing more and more of now, probably because we're screening of it, and obviously more, more and more of these patients coming through. But I'm sure you've all familiar with this, this scoring system, which is quite difficult to use really in the ICU setting, but if you have a score of six to eight, there's a high probability. Our first HeartMate 3 that we did in 2015 actually developed a hit, so I thought I'd mention this case. This was a guy that had a HeartMate 3 and was running into some difficulties at day 7, and when he had a CT chest, there was a pulmonary embolus involving the right lower lobe and also thrombus in the SVC, internal jugular veins, and also intraatrial clot. So the management of HIT is you would stop the heparin as soon as you suspect it, and it's not enough just to stop heparin. You need to start our gatriban, which is... Uh, what we use in our centre, monitoring the APTT. And of course, you would then expect um, some improvements in the platelet counts. Looking at bleeding outside the chest, um, this is uh, from the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation um, a couple of years ago. If you look at these patients, if you follow these patients up in the outpatient, you know, 20 to 30% of these patients are, with LVADs are presenting with GI bleeding. In the UK, they're all on aspirin and warfarin. I think in the States, some of them are on dual antiplatelet therapy and warfarin. And the INR tends to be 2 to 2.5. So you may get involved with these patients if they're coming in with a massive GI bleed. The question is whether you reverse, this, reverse the INR completely. In a GI bleed, if it's, if it's fairly manageable, you may just hold off the warfarin and just wait and see what happens. But clearly, you need to get early gastrointestinal uh, team involvement, interventional radiology involvement. Surgery is obviously a last resort. We have done nine laparotomies in the last couple of years on patients on ECMO, and bleeding has been manageable. Here's another interesting case that we had on the ICU, um, a chap with a BIVAD who was waiting for a transplant. I think this is the chap that was um, 130 days on the unit, who had bleeding from um, a surprising place. So he had abdominal distension, CT abdomen showed this pararenal hematoma, and the bleeding was coming from the lumbar artery which is extremely rare. But in patients with continuous devices, they get these AV malformations. So he was taken to the embolization suite, and you can see that the clips were deployed, and the bleeding did seem to settle down. This was a patient who presented a year after having his heart mate too um, implanted, came in very breathless, anemic, deranged, obviously he's on warfarin. Um, CT chest shows bleeding around the LV apex. So he was taken straight to theatre. Um, and there was some evidence of erosion around the LVAD cable tie, which they managed to fix. Another group of patients that are becoming more familiar are the patients with the LVADs who their right heart catheter pressures are now improving and now they're suitable for transplant. So here's a patient who had a HeartMate 3 with an aortic valve replacement in 2015 and then came in a couple of weeks ago for transplant. So obviously they're coming in with INRs of 2.5 to 3. So our guidelines are that we use Octoplex. The maximum dose we'd use is 2,000 units, 50 units per kilo. We have heard this morning about the case reports of, I think they gave the example of, they, they'd given 22 units per kilo of Octoplex and then they, they witnessed on the TOE intraoperatively thrombus. We tend to bolus it, but I think having heard that talk this morning, we may, I may change my practice to giving that slowly over an infusion. But we tend to give 1,000 to 2,000 units in these patients coming in who are warfarinized, going straight to theatre for a transplant. And we use trazodol in these patients as well. Um, I'll just get all these up together. So this is the patient. Um, this is the LVAD explant to transplant patient. And this is the first TEG coming off bypass. So... We're obviously going to give protamine to reverse the heparin. We gave two FFP, two cryo, and two platelets. And we can now see something that resembles a, a nearly normal tag. Um, still a very prolonged R time, but no difference between the, the heparin and uh, playing cup. So two more doses of FFP were given. And this is the time that we talked about the hemostatic break, that the surgeon needs to go away, have a break, and then we decide whether we're going to close the chest or not. One more bag of platelets was giving because the MA was slightly low and we didn't want to give any more volume, so we gave another 1,000 units of octoplex. The patient was actually struggling from the left heart point of view, not a right heart point of view, and was put onto peripheral ECMO. We decided to 
pack the chest and just close up the skin. Taken back to the unit on the cell saver. We had three litre flows on the ECMO. ACTs were maintained without any heparin for 48 hours and uh, a near normal tag when we got back to the ICU. The chest was closed at 48 hours. The platelet count was less than 50, so they had one bag of platelets and they were successfully weaned off ECMO at 72 hours. Here's an LVAD uh, HeartMate 3 patient. Um, we can see that we've got 4.4 litre flows, but the patient's running into some difficulty on the ICU. We've now got a CVP of 34. They're still ventilated. So we're now seeing some right heart failure in someone who's got HeartMate 3. And this was about 72 hours after the HeartMate 3 was implanted. And we've now got signs of worsening liver function and deranged clotting. Or do we have any alternatives? Because certainly we know now that this patient is highly likely to have problems with bleeding. I'll skip over that. I'm sure you've seen that earlier today. So rather than opening the chest in someone who's got very deranged clotting and liver function, the alternative is to do a percutaneous RVAD, which we did in the cath lab. The patient's INR was three, and we gave 1,000 units of octoplex rather than completely reversing um, the INR back to normal. So looking at non-surgical cause of bleeding in these patients, um, we've spoken about patients with continuous devices developing these AV malformations, and there's quite a lot in the literature now about the acquired von Willebrand disease in patients with LVADs. This is an interesting paper that I found um, from a J Japanese series looking at patients presenting with intracranial bleeds. And looking through our 80 patients that we've done in Manchester, a couple have presented with massive intracranial hemorrhage, but unfortunately not made it to hospital. But this group looked at patients, LVAD patients with uh, massive intracranial hemorrhage presenting to hospital and split them into an FFP and PCC group. And of the ones in the PCC group, those were, were successfully operated on neurosurgically and went on to have heart transplant. So the recommendations are that in patients presenting with intracranial bleed, you would use prothrombin complex. Um, to reverse the bleeding. Device thrombosis. In 2011-12, it was noticed in the States that there was an increase of patients presenting with um, device thrombosis. Pre-2011, the incidence of thrombosis was around about 2.2%, but they noticed later on that year that um, it had gone up to 5%, and the median time from implant to thrombosis had come down from 18 months to 3 months. So they looked quite extensively of what was going on in these patients. We couldn't really identify whether there was any different uh, implant techniques or any difference uh, in patient factors. But certainly what they did notice is that the LDH is a very useful marker. So in, patient, in the outpatient clinic in our hospital, the patients are having fairly intense for the couple of first few months looking at their LDH markers as a guide to their warfarin therapy. But now we're on to the HeartMate 3 and the Momentum study, which was published last year, absolutely no thrombosis around the world with a HeartMate 3. And the technology with this is, is different to the HeartMate 2, which is axial. This is a magnetically le levitated flow technology um, with less friction and less wear. There's also this artificial pulse. Um, I think that's the end of the talk. <laughs>